Good afternoon. My name's Amy McDonald. I run this place. It's killing me, but it's worth it. It's a nice death. How many, um, how many people, this is your first time here? Wow. Um, come back. Um, go to our website, wbur.org. Uh, city space, you see some of the things that are coming up. Uh, I love to call this the new civic institution of Boston, the 92nd Street Y of Boston. We do everything we do, dance and music and food and moth storytelling and podcasts and serious journalism. So check it out and come back. There's something for everyone. How many people here have read Little Women? <laughs> How many people have seen the movie? How many people here relate to Joe the most? Meg, Beth, Amy. <laughs> uh, we, um, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, panelists brief briefly. Megan Marshall could not be with us today. She had to be in New York City tomorrow, and the storm made her nervous. So she left um, yesterday, and uh, Laura Karop. Korupkin, am I saying it right? A uh, professor at BU uh, specializing in 19th and 20th century American literature. Women are her specialty. Graciously, graciously stepped in, and she's passionate about little women. And so this is going to be a wonderful conversation with her and Anne, who was at Fruitlands Museum on Thursday. She was on CBS Sunday Morning a couple of weeks ago talking about Little Woman and Greta Gerwig's movie. So check that out if you want. Chris Lydon's show, Open Source, which airs on WBUR Thursdays at 9 o'clock and Sunday at 2 o'clock, is doing a show on Little Women this week. They have an interview with Greta Gerwig, and they're also looking for people to call in. Um, and so I will give, so if anyone wants to, um, these are the two questions they want answered, so you may be on the radio. Um, if Why is the book meaningful to you, and which character do you most identify with and why? So little women and men out there, if you want to answer either one of those questions, call 617-651-2421. I'll say that again, 617-651-2421. If you're so inclined, call and leave, it, uh, leave a message, and they may edit it and include it on their radio hour. Please welcome Anne and Laura. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Let me ask you this. If I just talk, can you hear me? No. no. All right. <laughs> OK. Fine. Then I didn't bother asking, because I know the answer. <laughs> All right. How about now? All right. All right. This is a wonderful book. If you love Little Women, you will love Anne's book. So I'm just going to start by saying one or two quick things about it and then invite her to tell you more about it. Um, it is not just that the book will give you a very sharp, clean, clear summary of her life, if you don't know that much about it, the poverty of her childhood, the fact that she moved, what, 30 times by the time she was 20 and lived often on nothing but bread and water because her father thought it was beneath him to make money, though he was a transcendentalist. Um, <laughs> the ways that the Alcott family were and were not like the Marches. She also gives you a wonderful sense of the literary context into which the book was written. And her discussion of the book itself should permanently put to rest the phrase that this is a book about sweetness and light. Was that Hemingway, who I think someone, it is by showing us the sharp edges of these, this portrayal of four very imperfect young women working really hard to grow up. But the real heart of Rue's book is her research, which we'll want to hear more about today. Um, she catalogs very specifically for us, the impact of this novel over 150 years on readers, on readers who would later become writers because they read this book. She walks you through adaptations for television, movie, 
theater and one wonderful opera, um, which he can tell us about. And the, the often vexed critical reception of the book. She asks us why the book is no longer taught, a very good question, and why boys are never encouraged to read it, something we want to think about too. So let me start by asking. You didn't write this book as a movie tie-in, <laughs> although it's sort of become that. What made you write it? Um, well, in 2015, I was uh, wrapping up work on my previous book, which was a biography of a 19th century woman writer, Constance Fenimore Wilson. She was a friend of Henry James and overshadowed by him. But uh, I was worried about not having another project, so I started casting around for the next thing. And um, I really like books about books. I don't know if you've read Rebecca Mead's My Life in Middlemarch, which is a lovely book. Um, yes, uh, Maureen Corrigan, the Fresh Air book reviewer, she wrote a lovely book about uh, The Great Gatsby called So We Read On. There's also a wonderful book by Michael Gora um, about the portrait of a lady. And I thought, what a great way to write about literature for a wider audience, because my Wilson biography was kind of my step in away from academic writing and into writing for a general audience. And I loved the experience of it. I loved connecting with readers, which is hard to do as an academic, right? So it, it really, um, you know, that's kind of where the germ of the idea came from a book about a book. But then I wasn't sure what book I could write about that people would be as interested in as Middlemarch or Great Gatsby. And then in the middle of the night, I thought, what, why not Little Women? Um, that was a book I had read in graduate school for the first time. Mm. And so I was older, but I was in my early 20s. And that's the time when you're still searching, right? That's why you go to graduate school, because you don't know what you're going to do with your life. <laughs> you just keep going to school, uh, especially if you're going into English, right? And uh, so I, I, uh, I fell in love with Little Women. I fell in love with Joe, and I fell in love with Louisa. And they were in my dissertation, which became my first book, an academic book. And I named my daughter when she was born many years later. Um, I gave her the middle name Josephine. So, but I had kind of forgotten, you know, about it. And so this was a return to Little Women. And I got up the next morning and looked up when it was published, saw that it was uh, published in 1868. Uh -huh. This was in 2015. I realized, oh my gosh, the 150th anniversary is going to come up in years. three and a half years. I better get cracking, because I knew from this book I had just written that it takes, you really have to have the manuscript done a year before it comes out, because the whole copy editing and production and everything takes a year. So I really had two and a half years to write the book. And, um, and that's how it started. Great. Mm -hmm. So here's one of the things that I'd like to know. One of, and, and it's interesting, you can be thinking, we'll have time for questions also later. You do such a great job for us of showing, giving us the specifics of so many individuals' responses to the book. What did you learn from looking at responses over such a long period? We're talking about 150 years. Where they did people find different things in when they were reading in 1870 than in 1930? Or yes, absolutely. Um, that was one of the big surprises for me. So I came to this project out of love for the book, right? My own personal relationship to it. But once I started digging into the research, I was shocked and amazed at how much material is out there. There has been discussion about Little Women from the very beginning. It was such a popular book when it was first published. And the discussion has never stopped. Um, people are, are, you know, over the decades, they come to it from different perspectives. And it's a book that has lived on because, well, people see themselves in the book, but also it deals with the, so many issues that, um, that have remained very current. But it's interesting that, <clears throat> for instance, there's been a lot of talk in the last few decades, right, about, um, you know, the the women's roles in the book, domesticity, how Jo wants to, she has these ambitions to be a writer and doesn't want to get married, right? All this stuff which seems so pertinent to us now. Nobody talked about that. If you look at, the, at all the discussions and if you just Google it on the New York Times <laughs> or go to the New York Times website, you'll see every time there was a film, every time there was a major production somewhere, every time a new sort of special issue came out, 
there was discussion of Little Women. So over the years, you can really start to chart it. And um, nobody was talking about whether or not this was had some subversive or feminist elements to it until the feminist movement, frankly. Um, up until that point, people had talked about the book as being very nostalgic, very much about family, very um, Which it sentimental. Is. Are you saying yeah. it's not, it, I mean, it doesn't no, I'm not saying it, have that. Absolutely, but that wasn't the focus, right? It, that, or I should say that was the only focus for so many years. What I really try to argue in my book is that Little Women is a very big book. It contains multitudes like Walt Whitman, right? Um, in fact, I would, I would go so far as to say it's a book as big as Moby Dick. It has so much in it. There's so many elements. There's so many characters with different personalities, right? And uh, different roles that they're playing. And it spans so much time. And the girls grow up, and they struggle. And you know they go off in different directions, right? Joe goes to New York. Amy goes to Europe. Beth stays at home. Meg gets married. I mean, they're off, all off in these different paths in life. And we start to realize there's so much going on here. You cannot pin down this book as either a subversive feminist text or submissive sort of patriarchal propaganda, which other people have called it that too, right? It doesn't fit any of those molds because it is a book full of tensions. It's a book that, um, that wrestles with a lot of these ideas. And so we see that, you know, the conflicts between Joe and Amy, for instance. Joe is a character who breaks the mold, as Sonia Sanchez said, right? She's really um, somebody who is very, uh, very much an individual. And she feels that she has a right to pursue her own individual path in life. And as a woman, that was pretty difficult, right, at the time. But notice how nobody's around her telling her she can't do that or she shouldn't do that. Amy, of course, picks at her and is a little embarrassed by her. And there's some interesting conflicts between them, right? Because Amy's on a very different path. Amy's somebody who, you know, she's, she likes being beautiful. She loves beautiful things, and she likes the attention she gets from men, and she's quite comfortable in her role as a 19th century woman um, and, you know, gains the favor of Aunt March and so on because of the, the role that she's playing. So the tensions are there in the book, you know, between the characters. So to label the book as one thing or the other, I think, is too, um, is too easy. Well, let's talk. Let me... Let me push you a little bit on this because I love the point in your book where you say, is it subversive or is it submissive? Mm -hmm. And we, we stop and we really think, one thing we've been talking about it as if it's one book. We need to be reminded that it's really two books. The first book called Little Women came out in 1868 and when it, oh, here we go, sorry. <laughs> when the first book ends, Father has just come home from the war. Beth is alive, but sickly. Um, and Joe is absolutely, positively not married. And that book was such a huge hit and a huge success that Alcott, Alcott, Alcott immediately started working her, uh, with great encouragement from her publisher on a second one. And the publisher was very insistent, even though she said, I don't want my Joe to marry Laurie, and I don't really want her to get married. It was, and those who have seen the movie will recognize this, it was the publisher who said, you've got to marry them. The second book, uh, in England, it was published and, and remained, you do a nice job with this in your book, two separate books. The second book is all the marriages, Joe's death, romance. Mm -hmm. And when we think about it, the movement over the course of the book, we have to think about this conflict. So many women have, as you say, have felt themselves authorized to be feisty, even angry, transgressive, to have ambitions. This is a book that says that's OK. But, but it doesn't sell. Um, it right. doesn't sell. Joe gets married. She gives up her major role as a writer. Uh, all of the girls basically become the very good women that mommy wants them to be. Or do they? Or do they? Or do they? Your turn. 
Um, well, first of all, I would say that, that Little Women is two very different books, and I think it's really important to remember that. And I try to tell uh, young people who look at this big, you know, 500-page book that, you know, you don't have to read the whole thing. You could read the first book, and that's self-contained in and of itself. I really wish publishers would publish it in two volumes. Right in America as they do in every other part of the English speaking world still. Unfortunately, the second volume throughout, you know, the UK and Ireland, Australia, is called Good Wives. Um, yeah, and that was, uh, Alcott did not sanction that. She, um, she uh, had nothing to do with that. They had no copyright over in England. And so the publishers over there pirated it and gave it whatever names they wanted. And the, the title of Good Wives stuck. And it's still called that today in England. And I met some really interesting women um, from other parts of the world. And their little women is very different from what we know because most of them didn't read Good Wives. And it, uh, as, one young woman, as one woman said to me, why would I have wanted to read a book called Good Wives? <laughs> right? Good point, right? So, um, so I, you, know, you, you read some things that, that people have written about the book elsewhere, and they'll say things like, I was so glad Beth didn't die, and you know, Beth, that Joe didn't marry, and things like that, and, or Joe wasn't going to get married. And you realize that they've had a different experience with the book. Here, I think our relationship to it has been more complicated. <coughs> A lot of young girls respond to that first half of the book when they're still young. And then as they grow up, things get complicated, right? They have, they have tough decisions to make, compromises to make. And, uh, and Beth's death uh, has a huge impact on Jo. So, so yes, Alcott did not want to marry Jo off. She wanted to keep her a literary spinster. But it was the pressure from all of those readers after reading the first volume who were writing to her and wanted to know who the March sisters married. And, and Louisa grumbled in a letter as if that were the only end and aim of a woman's life. And she did not want to marry her to Lori. She would not marry her to Lori to suit anyone, and she would instead make a funny match for him, for her. And so the funny match was with Professor Bear. So this is why I said, or do they? Because I think the match between Joe and Professor Bear is not a traditional marriage, right? This is not, um, this is not Louisa May Alcott completely falling into line and saying, OK, I'll give you a happy romance. You know, and there's that chapter called Under the Umbrella. And sure, they do get together under the umbrella, and it's raining. It's kind of romantic. But it's also, it's also anti-romantic, the whole scene. If you read this, when uh, they're, it's raining, they're dropping their packages. She says anybody walking by would think they were lunatics because they were so bumbly and didn't know what they were doing. It's not a classic romantic scene at all. So she's, what she's doing is poking holes in her readers' romantic expectations and showing them that a match between a man and a woman isn't all you know, riding off into the sunset. In fact, in the book, so we have these two books, right? At the, begin at the end of um, the first book, Meg is engaged already, the oldest, right. uh, the oldest right. girl. In the second book, she gets married right away. What? Meg gets married halfway through Little Women? Wait, I thought they were all supposed to end with marriage, right? The, all the girls were supposed to get married at the end. But what she shows us is that there is life after marriage, right? The story doesn't necessarily end there which is very, very subversive for the time period, to show one of your main characters marry halfway through. And not only that, Meg still grows after she marries. She still struggles. She still has flaws. She still has a lot of learning and growing to do. What do you know, right? She's still growing and changing. And she's learning to adapt to her marriage. That, If you haven't read it recently and you don't remember the current Jelly fiasco, you have to read it again. <laughs> because that, to me, is one of the best scenes. Yeah, it's it's really quite remarkable. Um, she gets in a fight with John Brooke, and you know, over the jelly, and it's just you know, you feel for Meg. It's tough being the perfect wife, and then when the children are born, it's tough being the perfect mother, and she has to adapt to this. And her mom, Marmy, comes and tells her, "You need to invite John into the nursery, right? Don't leave him out." Um, in other words, don't have such strictly segregated gender roles in your marriage. This was the Alcott influence, right? The transcendentalist influence. The transcendentalists were feminists in many ways. Margaret Fuller, not in all ways, in many ways. <laughs> 
Margaret Fuller was a transcendentalist and she was one of our earliest feminists. She had a tremendous impact on Abigail Alcott. They were friends of the girl's mother and on Louisa too. And we see those ideas coming through in the way the marriages are portrayed in the book. At the end, Joe and Professor Bear have a school together, right? So they're, they're sharing their sphere, right? They're not, you know, she's not the, the mother living at home, the angel in the house, and he's going off to work every day. They're working and living together, sharing that space. Um, and that was the, an ideal of marriage that she promoted. If she had to write about marriage, she was going to mix it up a little bit. I agree with you completely, and I'm interested when we get to questions uh, from the audience also about this. Because when you read it as an adult, not as a kid, but as someone who has the experiences maybe of being a parent, um, the modernness, which we were talking about earlier, of the book, the way that this is also a book about a single mother bringing up four girls because father is away at the war and without much money. One of the best things to me about this book is that it says, you know, money is important. It isn't just you want there's a lot of disdain for rank consumerism and materialism and superficiality, but not for the fact that Joe writes stories to get money. And she details when each story is sold, this one paid for fixing the roof, and this one got us a new whatever it is, something in the house, and this one took care of that. that Having an, uh, an awareness of money, having it as a motive, is not something that should be outside a good woman's purview. We're allowed to be aware of economic things in a major way. And also that I don't think it would be a better book if, if it left you with either or. Either she can be a writer or she can be a, a wife, not both. The modern question for women and men today is how to have all of it, how to have a marriage and a career and a family. And that's where she takes it. That seems to be much more modern. Right. And so when I first read the book in graduate school um, and I was looking ahead to my life, what would I do? You know, I wanted to have a family someday, but I also wanted to be a writer. I wanted to, you know, maybe be a professor. How was I going to do all of those things? I mean, these are the things that the young women still don't know, right? There's nobody pointing us in a specific path. I have young women come to me all the time and ask me, how did you do it? Right? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, you just kind of muddle through it. But you, I mean, she addresses this in the yep. book, I think, because it, people assume, people say a lot, um, that you know, the ending of the book is so disappointing and upsetting because Professor Bear makes her give up her writing and she burns it and throws away her pen and she never writes again. And this is the great tragedy or the betrayal even of Joe March by Alcott. That's not really what happens, actually. She does write again after mm -hmm. she burns her sensation stories that she writes in New York. Um, she writes again after Beth dies, and she writes about she writes about Beth. She writes about her family. Mm -hmm. um, these stories are published. They're very very popular. People are writing to her, and her father tells her, "You found your true style at last." Um, so she has uh, some success as a writer on her own, and then at the end of the book when she's married to Professor Bear and she's looking back over her life and she's thinking about the castles in the air that all the girls had earlier in the book, hers was to be a famous writer. And she says, yeah, that does seem sort of cold to me now, but um, I still hope to write, write a great book someday. And I hope, I think it will be better for these examples and experiences I'm having now. And that was quite remarkable. I and mean, she's married at the end. She has two kids at the end. She's running a school. The idea, and I'd never heard this before. The idea that a woman might actually write a better book after becoming mm -hmm. a wife and a mother, that was, you don't see that anywhere else in 19th century literature. And I know because I, I, yeah, well. Never mind. Okay, <laughs> we can talk about that. But, it's, we'll about but, but this positive portrayal of a woman writer, first of all, was very, very unusual. Nobody's telling Joe March, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't do this. You should be ashamed of it, you should be embarrassed. Nathaniel Hawthorne lived virtually next door to them. 
and he had a very low opinion of women writers, the damned mob of scribbling women, he called them. He told his wife, Sophia Hawthorne, who was a gifted writer herself, but she you know, tucked her pen away after marrying him. She was so glad she didn't prostitute herself before the public the way other women writers did. That was the conventional attitude toward women writers. You don't see even a hint of that in Little Women. And that's, the credit really goes to her parents for raising her in that way. We should notice, though, that at the same time, that guys like Hawthorne, whose Scarlet Letter was a bestseller by selling 10,000 copies over 10 years, the real best-selling writers in America in this period were the women, mm -hmm. were Uncle Tom's Cabin, which sold 2 million copies right. and kept the presses running, were Wide, Wide World. The wit there were many, many more in the 1850s in America, the writers who sold the most books were women. Let's all right. Let's let's move on to the movie. Yeah, let's talk. Let's about the talk movie. about the movie. I understand that we have the the trailer to see. I'm working on a novel. It is a story of my life and my sisters. Make it short and spicy. And if the main character is a girl, make sure she's married by the end. Ow, Every Joe! Second. I want to be an artist in Rome and be the best painter in the world. That's what you want too, isn't it, Joe? To be a famous writer? Yes, but it sounds so crass when she says it. My girls have a way of getting into mischief. Well, so do I. This is Meg, Amy, Beth, and Joe. <laughs> I intend to make my own way in the world. No one makes their own way. Least of all a woman. You'll need to marry well. But you are not married, aren't you? Well, that's because I'm rich. Joe, would you like to dance with me? I can't because I scorched my dress. And Meg told me to keep still so no one would see it. I have an idea of how we can manage. Joe is a lost cause. So you are your family's hope now. I believe we have some power over who we love. It isn't something that just happens to a person. I think the poets might disagree. We can leave right now. I'll sell stories. Joe. And you, you should be an actress and you should have a life on the stage. Just because my dreams are different than yours doesn't mean they're unimportant. I have hey. loved you ever since I've known you, Joe. I couldn't help it. It would be a disaster if we It married, wouldn't be a disaster. Okay? We'd be miserable. Joe. We would be a perfect I saint. I can't. A new play written by Miss Joe March. <laughs> Women, they have minds and they have souls as well as just hearts. I want to be great or nothing. And they've got ambition and they've got talent as well as just beauty. And I'm so sick of people saying that love is just all a woman is fit for. I'm so sick of it. Does she marry? Oh, I have to go see it again. <laughs> Let's all just go out and see the movie again right now. Can I just say Timothy Chalamet, best Lori ever? With apologies to Christian Bale, I know. He, <laughs> he's well, why don't we? Okay, so here's the question: What did you think of the movie? What did you like about it? Was there anything that it didn't do right? What is? What did it do? Better, you know, you know all the other movies, TV versions, theater right. versions. I have, a, yes, I did a whole chapter on the adaptations. I knew they were making this film for a long time. I've had a Google alert for Greta Gerwig and Little Women, you know, since 2015. Um, and uh, she started writing the movie, I guess, before Lady Bird even. So um obviously they put it on hold so she was doing that and it's a good thing they did because now she has you know after her nomination for best director for that she has a lot more clout in hollywood and i think the the movie then 
started to gain a lot more momentum. A lot of, there was so much anticipation about it. Um, and uh, anyway, so I've, I've, I've been anticipating it for a long time because mm. it's really interesting The producers of this film are the same producers who made the 1994 film. Amy Pascal was the one who, she, it took her 12 years to get the 94 film made, to get the male executives at Sony to agree to make this movie. And her name is actually Amy Beth Pascal. She's named after two of the March sisters. I guess her mom was reading it when she was pregnant with her. So this has been a very special book to her. And, and the fact that she wanted to make it again with also Denise DeNovi and Robin Swicord, who was a screen, she was the screenwriter or scriptwriter for the uh, 94 film. And they're all producers on this movie. So it's clear that they understood that we needed a new adaptation for a new generation. Because the adaptations are really what keeps a book like this alive. Um, you know, we need this kind of uh, larger cultural conversation around a text that, that films and adaptations generate to keep it fresh in our minds and to make it a living text, one that we're always discussing and arguing about and having disagreements about and realizing how much a book like this matters to us. Um, so what's I, new here? What, what, what's in this movie that isn't in the earlier ones? Well, there's a, yeah. It's really interesting because it's very new, but it's also very faithful. So the 94 film, uh, Robin Swicord wrote a film that she, a script that she thought Louisa May Alcott would have written today if she were alive. Like, didn't have the constraints on her at the time, right? She wouldn't have written the book. <clears throat> well, <laughs> but she, uh, she completely rewrote it. So there's no dialogue from the book that makes it into the film, for instance. Um, she added a lot of things uh, that aren't said in the book. And this film, however, Greta Gerwig went back to the book and she pulled things out of it that sound so modern to us now, like Amy saying, I want to be great or nothing. Or um, the really significant line when Marmy says yes. uh, she's consoling Joe, who's struggling with her temper. She's let Amy fall through the ice and she feels terrible about it. She's, Mom, you don't understand. And Marmy says to her, no, I do understand. I'm angry nearly every day of my life. That is in the book. It's from the book, and nobody ever said it on the big screen before. The first time it was ever in an adaptation was the BBC masterpiece adaptation that came out two Christmases ago in the UK, and then um, a year and a half ago in, on PBS. And that portrayal, Emily Watson, if you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing it just to see Emily Watson as, as Marmy. Not Emma Watson, Emily Watson. Emily Watson, yeah. right different woman. But different. I wanted to read a little something from my book because um, obviously the, my book came out in August 2018 before this film, um, so I didn't have a chance to see it. They hadn't even made it yet. And, um, but I say here, I look at all the adaptations. Um, there are many, many adaptations over the years in lots of different countries all over the world in different languages. Um, I couldn't watch them all, of course, but the ones that I could get my hands on and could understand, um, I watched. And to me, the most successful adaptation, narratively speaking, was the 1998 opera by Mark Adamo. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that. It was shown on great performances on PBS in 2001, so you can get a DVD and watch it. Um, and let me read to you what I wrote about what made it a successful adaptation. The story Adamo tells does exactly what an adaptation should do. It opens up the original text and makes you feel like you understand it even more deeply. It's not only a work of art in its own right, but it's also in deep conversation with the original, as if the two are distinct entities existing side by side, each enriching the other. The opera makes you want to go back and read Alcott's work, not to compare or check for points of dissimilarity, but to reread it with fresh eyes. That, to me, is what this film does, to be honest. And I would say that makes it now the most successful adaptation because there's not music, right, the opera. But it's, it's that ability to create a work of art that stands on its own and is clearly not trying to duplicate something that Alcott did. You can't put a book on the screen. You can't duplicate the experience that we have, the immersive experience of reading a book with what happens on the film. So what she's done instead is she's taken all these different threads from Little Women and she's unwoven them 
and then she weaves them back together in a fresh way. Those of us who know the book so well, you sit there and watch the movie, you have no idea what's coming next. You can't tell, right? Right, because she mixes up the chronology. Right, and that's what, that's, really what well. that's what Adama's that's what Adama's opera does as well. He actually really starts good. near the end of the book when Teddy or Laurie comes back from Europe and comes up into Joe's attic and talks to her about tells her that he's married to Amy. Now that's where that move that's where the play or I'm sorry the yeah. opera starts, hmm. and then it goes back to the beginning, and providing that sort of glimpse of where things are going adds a kind of resonance and emotional depth to all the scenes earlier on. This movie does that um, even more aggressively, right? Because we have so many flashbacks throughout the film, right? Going back to those earlier points. But by showing us the girls as adults, as mm -hmm. separate, unique individuals who are all on their own paths doing their own things, and then going back to them as children, we realize all that was lost, right? All they've given up and all the attachments that they had and how difficult it is to keep those attachments as they're growing older. And it makes it a more bittersweet film, I think, a more bittersweet story. So it's not sentimental, right? It's not, um, it's not you know, super feminist or super this or that. It's more emotionally, I think, rich and deep. And then there's the ending, which we can talk about too. But. Should we see the other the other clip? Sure. Do you want to see? Yeah. Some well, here we have a we have a clip from a scene. This is when Joe, who has been writing sensational stories and has had them published, shows them to Friedrich, to Professor Bear, and he's read them. Yeah. It's Go. such an interesting scene, isn't it? Right. And it's. It's not exactly what happens in the book, which is fine. It's which fine. is fine because it it it, it ignites an, another conversation, I think, about her, her her sensation stories that she was writing at the time. Is he putting her down or is he supporting her? Mm -hmm. He tells her she has. He says, "I don't like this work, but yes, you have talent, right. and has no one ever taken you seriously before?" Yeah. Um, and I think what she's doing here is yes. I mean, on the. I think she's in some ways rehabilitating Professor Bear because of the bad image that he's had over the years. If you look at the book, he doesn't attack her writing directly. He thinks she's probably writing for these uh, he thinks it's papers. Immoral. Yeah, and he lets her know he thinks that kind of writing is immoral, but he never directly attacks her. But he does offer her Shakespeare as kind of you know a good mm -hmm. model to follow, and mm -hmm. he's prodding her in the direction of a more realistic literature. Yes, um, and uh, we. When Little Women was published, we didn't know that Joe March was yes. very much like her creator because Alcott was writing these sensation stories, and they weren't discovered until many, many years. I think the mid, I think the 1950s, they 1950s. were first discovered right. because they were published under pseudonyms, oh. right? A.M. Barnard was the one that she often used. She didn't want people to know about them, just like Joe March doesn't want her parents to know that she's writing these stories when she's in New York, and she has them published anonymously right. in and the then, weekly volcano. And then two scholars thought, well, maybe she wrote them too, and went over to Houghton Library at Harvard and started looking at the correspondence of publishers. And they found letters to her. And there are now volumes of these stories. And I'm going to make a pitch for them. They're wonderful. <laughs> Everybody in both Joe and everyone that writes about the book and the movie are perfectly happy to say, well, she had to leave that kind of stuff behind and write what she knew, the realistic story. But they are gothic, they are sensational, and she had such a good time writing them. I teach them. My students love them. If you are looking, if you like Little Women, go find Behind a Mask and other stories. This is, and in fact, when one of her friends told uh, Louisa, said, Little Women shows your real style of writing, the pure and gentle type, she said, you know, not really. My natural ambition is for the lurid style. <laughs> she said, but what would my good father think of me if I set folks to doing the things I have a longing to see my people do? <laughs> but these stories, I mean, they are not little women. They have murder. They have incest. They have a woman who takes drugs to subdue her sexuality. This is, I'm not kidding you. And <laughs> Behind a Mask, though, is the best thing written in the 19th century about gender and class and how we are all 
performing roles all the time. And the main character, who is a governess, is scheming and manipulative and out to take it, you know, triumph over these snooty aristocrats she works for by marrying the richest guy around. And she does, and she is not punished, and she wins. Well, I think you've made. I think you've made some sales here. I see some people looking it up on their phone. Because she could write them without having to be moral, without having to have marry anybody off in the end, without having her father looking over her shoulder. Well, she didn't have to make They're a lot of great. the compromises have you read that them? she had to make in in writing Little Women, right? Yeah. And I think what's so what I love so much about Greta Gerwig's film is that she is highlighting these compromises and she's making this question why does little women end the way it does why does joe march have to marry professor bear and i don't know how you felt about the ending but there are really two endings to the movie and some people think oh she never did marry professor bear right or some people think well she did and and she published her book i mean there's been this interesting kind of conversation going on about what the ending means my personal interpretation is that uh, greta gerwig has said that she uh, wrapped together some of Joe, some of Louise's experiences in her portrayal of Joe. And Joe does say some lines in the film that are taken from Louise's own journals, like when she says, I'd rather be a spinster and paddle my own canoe, that's, that's Louisa. Um, and so what she's done at the end is she's unraveled Joe and Louisa. And we see Joe you know, have Plumfield and Mary Professor Bear and have kids, and then we see Louisa publishing her book. Um, so when she talks about, when she talks to the publisher at the end about, um, you know, what to do with these characters, really it's kind of like Louisa having these negotiations. And we don't know that she necessarily sat down with the publisher and had this conversation, but the, the girls clearly wanted her to marry. She felt pressured to marry her off. Um, and so, so Greta Gerwig has said that we still don't know how to tell stories about women's lives. It's still difficult. And it's still, we still don't know how to end them, right? What's the end point? Can, you know, should this be marriage? Are there other options? And I love how she opens the trailer and she opens the movie with this scene of the publisher telling her, you know, make sure if your main character is a girl, make sure she gets married at the end or dies. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's the kind of pressure that women have felt over the years in terms of figuring out how to tell stories about women and how do we break that mold. And Greta Gerwin's just, just cracked it open for us and, and given us the possibility of thinking about a different ending for Joe. And that is what makes this, I think, such a successful and interesting adaptation because it's not trying to duplicate the experience of little women. It's a comment on Little Women, really, and it's Gerwig's own creation, her own work of art. One final question, and then we're going to throw it open for people. We've been talking about women's experience wonderfully. I see some guys here. <laughs> there are some men who, have you read the book? Any guys read the book? Like it? Yeah. Why don't, tell, one of the things you give a whole section to in your book is, why don't why aren't boys encouraged to read it? Why has it disappeared from schools? Uh, right. Well, I, na I naively assumed when I started this project that I would find some schools, some teachers who were teaching the book and would um, share with me the experiences they've had within the classroom and what the kids think about it today. And I started reaching out to teachers and I started getting these really uh, amazing responses that I would never teach little women. And one uh, teacher said to me, I would never teach little women because it's a private book for girls, not suitable for the public classroom. And uh, so that became- What are they supposed to be doing with it? They're supposed to be reading it under the covers at home with the flashlight all by themselves so nobody sees them. It's a dangerous book, right? No, it's, it's that was very, very interesting to me. It spoke volumes about how we feel about stories that are about girls, right? There's something for, for mothers to pass down to their daughters and grandmothers to pass down. But, and, and Little Women has remained an important book through those means, but not because it's taught in classrooms. It used to be taught in classrooms. When the 1933 film with Katherine Hepburn came out, the National Council of Teachers of English sent study guides to every high school in the country because it was so widely taught, yeah. 
and so widely read. And th we've had this real sort of bifurcation in our reading habits and in a gender segregation of literature. And it's, it's not just literature, right? It starts when they're babies and the different onesies that you can buy, uh, boy, you know, pink or blue, and the toys that, that uh, children play with, and then the books that they're supposed to read. And I have a whole chapter about this uh, called Can Boys Read Little Women? Well, spoiler alert, yes, they can. It won't kill them. <laughs> and I had some experiences sharing it with some sixth grade boys um, that I talk about in the book at my daughter's school. And nobody shamed them about it, and it was perfectly fine, and they enjoyed it, and they learned a lot and wrote these great little papers about it. And, and you know, it was okay. I mean, that was sixth grade, though. Seventh grade, eighth grade, it might have been a different deal. Um, I had a woman, I, when I was at Fruitlands the other night, one woman raised her hand and told me that um, she really wanted to see Little Women, the new movie. And she had her son home from college. And they got in the car. She's like, oh, I'm glad you want to go see a movie with me. Let's go. And he says, what are we seeing? And she said, we're going to go see Little Women. And he said, no, I can't go. I can't go. So they, I said, what did you do? We turned around and we went home. Yeah. And I, I totally, I understand. She didn't want to force him to do it. But there's so much shame attached to walking into a theater that says little women, the fear of being the only man in the audience. Or, you know, maybe if there were some guys, they went into a group, I don't know. But it's, it, it, it really deserves a larger conversation. And it is, what's so interesting to me is I brought this up in the book, and I was a little nervous about doing that because nobody's really talked about that before. And it treads on, you know, our current weeding habits, how we raise boys and all these things, you know, big issues. But what's been so interesting to me with this film coming out is it's definitely part of the cultural conversation about this movie. Absolutely. Have you noticed there have been a lot of articles about this? Can men see little women? Tracy Letts, who um, played the publisher in the movie, he wrote a little piece for GQ that was published right before the movie came out about you know, men should go see this movie, and he was so proud of working on this film, and it had all the male cast members in a very GQ-looking photo. Look it up, it's really cute. But <clears throat> what they understood, though, these producers, and, and earlier, the earlier producers, they didn't feel, that, you know, they didn't think they were gonna get the men to come in necessarily, it was gonna be a women's film, but this time they wanted the men to come to the theater. The early screenings of Little Women, when they invited the Academy voters to come, almost all women, and they knew they were in trouble because the Academy voters are largely heavily male, yep. and they weren't coming out to see it. And many of them said they weren't interested in it. And so there's been a bit of a campaign, uh, but there's also been a lot of discussion. Janet Maslin had a really great sort of Twitter thing going about it. And um, anyway, I'll leave that one up for discussion still if we still want to talk about it. I think it's it, time, I think we'll it's time to turn it over here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. my name is Sybil Sanders, and I wanted to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. So I am a person who invited my son and husband, who, my son is 25, and my husband to go see it with me on Christmas Day opening. Am I holding this right? Yep, yeah, perfect. Um, for Christmas Day, so it was a Christmas slash Hanukkah gift. And um, I told my son he needed to go see it for the women in his life. And also Absolutely. to better understand his mother, me, because I happen to come from a family of four girls, one brother, and um, I won't go into how much we resemble and who resembles <laughs> the four sisters in the book. Um, but the, uh, I was wanting to ask you, if I have to ask a question that I could go on well, about. Well, did they like it? Yes, and we had a, incredible conversations that have continued to follow since then because they wanted to know who, especially me, my son really wanted to know more about his mother. So who, you know, who did I, did I think I most resembled and who he thought I most resembled. And so we had, you know, and so it was quite interesting. I think a lot of men have felt the way Lori does in the book, kind of peeking in through the window and looking at the March sisters as exactly. if he doesn't belong to this very yeah. female-centered matriarchal world. And that's an uncomfortable position to be in. I understand yeah. that. But it's the position that women have been in as readers for generations when oh. most of the books that we've read in school have been about boys growing up. Lord of the Flies, Tom Sawyer, exactly. Huck Finn, Catcher in the you know, the list goes oh. on. Yeah. And we're used to doing that. And we learn a lot from that experience, right? Why shouldn't boys also 
be on the outside looking in and learning what it's like for the other half of the population to grow up. I had a librarian tell me after reading my book that she often encourages kids to read across divides or lines of, of things like class or ethnicity, nationality, race, right? Read about people who are different from yourself. She never thought about recommending that they read across gender. That never even occurred to her before. Right, and there are, there are so many um, sub uh, topics of you know equal pay that are really current issues. Equal pay, you know, race and racism. You know, that's that whole story of her father, you know, starting the school. But my two my my uh, questions I'd like to um, you to to talk about. Is, so I immediately went home and started Google, googling Little Women. First of all, when I was young, I read it like I think I was 11, 12, 13 years old. I did not like this book. I didn't think that it was pr appropriate for young girls, um, and I um, and I didn't like it because I didn't want to hear about this patriarchy thing about having to get married and having to do all this. I, and so I really did not like it for a number of years until I picked it up much later. And and I've seen this film three times, in fact, so I've completely changed. But I find it's, I don't think it is for young girls. I think it's for old, I think it's for, you know, 20-somethings and above, you know, once we sort of get into the world and start discovering, you know, all this stuff. But anyway, uh, so I went home and Googled and I read a, a, the Par an article on the have, Paris Review. Do you have a question? Review. Do you I want do. to ask here that question? I saw, here's the Paris Review on, there's an article on Beth uh, compared to um, Alcott's sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you, uh, do you, can you expand about on, on Beth, you know, Beth and her real life sister? Briefly. Yeah, briefly. I think, yeah, um, Beth is a character who's very overlooked and underestimated. And she's drawn a lot of negative reactions from my students over the years. Unbelievable things that they'll say. I'm so glad she died. She's insufferable, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Which has been shocking to me, right? And But anyway, I, not a lot of sympathy for Beth, unfortunately. But um, she, the, the real Lizzie did die. Lizzie Alcott did die um, after she contracted scarlet fever when she was young, almost died, but survived. Years later, they don't know what she died of. She died of what was really a wasting disease. She was skin and bones when she died. And I do have some comments about that um, because I think we need to consider that Beth, Beth has her own path in life and may be making some very disastrous choices about her health and her inability to grow up because she does say some things to Joe in the book about how she never envisioned herself growing up like the other girls. She couldn't think into the future in that way. And I think that something that, that girls, many girls still struggle with, that inability to see themselves making that transition from girl to woman because it is, you know, it's scary. It can be a very scary process in our culture to become a woman with a woman's body. And I think that's part of what Beth is going through, frankly. So that's in the book. Could you discuss the relationship between Alcott and her father and how maybe mm -hmm. that was reflected either appropriately or inappropriately in the, in the book I think, and the movie? Yeah, I think, well, he's kind of left out of the book, right? They conveniently send him off to war, even though in real life it was Louisa who went to war as a nurse, right? The father was much too old to be going off to war and he wasn't a minister. Um, but she, she gets him off stage um, because Bronson Alcott was a very complicated man. They loved him, they adored him. They thought he had amazing ideas about education reform and the divine genius that exists in every child and how it was a parent's and a teacher's duty to nurture that in them and not let convention and social norms drum it out of them. Um, so they really admired him and loved him, but boy, the man could not keep a penny in his pocket. And he couldn't bring any pennies home either, let alone dollars. <laughs> and so, and he, he kind of disdained it. Yes, he. Which is Abigail, fine if you're furrow, but not if you yeah, have four children. Yeah, not if you have a wife and four children. And Abigail Alcott did say at one point, he seems ready to starve, and, uh, and myself and my daughters are implicated in this because he was um, he had such strict religious principles about 
not participating in a capitalist system, basically. Um, yeah, he was too idealistic. So, but they loved him and they adored him. He was also much ridiculed at the time for his some of his extreme ideas, and and not putting him on the page was saving him some of that ridicule. But as the book became more popular, she did start including some of his ideas later in the other books in Little Men and in Joe's Boys. We see some of his ed educational views become popularized through her books, which is interesting. Hi. Um, when I was growing up uh, and my mother presented me with this book, it was just sort of an understanding that this is a book that girls read. And I was curious, the more I've learned about it, was that true for girls in the South? Huh. Yes. So I live in New Orleans, and I've visited with many um, groups of older women, book groups. They have different clubs and things. There are many of them in New Orleans. And um, it's really interesting. Um, I'm not from the South, OK? But um, I'm from the North originally. But uh, they all seem to have grown up and loved it. And I remember one woman saying, this just really cracked me up. She said, um, yeah, I loved, I, loved, uh, I loved the March sisters. I loved little women until I realized that Mr. March was off fighting on the side of the union. <laughs> Yeah, the Confederacy lives on, unfortunately. Can you comment on the cinematography, the photography of the movie? Because I had a particular response to that. Oh, yeah, that's really outside of my area of expertise. I, I well, thought it was beautiful, and I know she used a lot of 19th century art that influenced her. There's that scene where they're on the beach uh, that looks like a Winslow Homer painting. Well, uh, that's the point, actually, is that I felt in some way it detracted from the reality of their lives. It was yeah, no, it's not, it's not meant to be a realistic film, I don't think. She was very clear. I think this is interesting. No, okay. Because those of us who want realism from it, the way we get so much realism from the book, I think, might be disappointed. But the, yes. book, the movie is a work of art. She really wanted to come out big and show us that Little Women was a book, that a masterpiece, that was suitable for this sort of adaptation, that was big and lavish and beautiful, and everyone is, the colors are so rich, right? She did it on film, not digital. And she's, that was, that was part of her uh, idea for the movie. And I have heard some people say that, though, that, oh, their hair's so beautiful, and their clothes are too pretty, and all the food and everything's too lavish. It's not, it doesn't have a gritty sort of realism that we might want from the book. If you watch the BBC PBS masterpiece adaptation, you get a bit more of that, yeah. So my question is about um, the books that were published after Little Woman. Um, Little Men and Joe's Boys, which are much more focused on the stories of boys mm -hmm. and young men. And um, since we've been talking about the relationship of boys to this story, I wonder what you mm -hmm. think about how those books continue and change the story of this family and, and kind of broaden it. Yeah, Louisa didn't really want to write a book for girls. So when she was asked by the publisher, Thomas Niles of Roberts Brothers, to write this book, she said, hmm. I don't really, you know, I'm not really interested. I never knew many girls or liked many girls except for my sister. She was a tomboy like Joe. And she, um, I think when she came to Little Men, she relished the idea of writing a book about boys, and that's why Joe has a school for boys. Um, but I think um, those stories, they become a lot. The Little Men is a story that a lot of boys have come to first and then gone back and read Little Women. I think that's how Teddy Roosevelt actually came to Louisiana. He was a big fan. The Rough Rider himself was an Alcott fan. But he, um, um, so the series, I think, opens it up and bronze it up, but the girls kind of disappear, except for there's one girl named Nan who is, Joe sees a lot of herself in this young girl, and they take her into the school and they educate her alongside the boys. And what's really neat is that in Joe's Boys, which was the last in the trilogy published in 1886, 18 years after Little Women, she allows, or she is allowed, I should say, Alcott's allowed to let Nan grow up and not marry. So in fact, Nan wants to be a doctor, and there's a boy who's after her, kind of like Lori was after Joe. And Mrs. Joe now, she's all grown up, steps in and tells the boy to back off. Let, you know, Nan's gonna be a doctor. She doesn't have time for marriage. And Nan actually, yeah, she remains single. And so she gets 
to keep, she gets that ending in Joe's Boys that she wasn't able to do in Little Women. Last one? Last, Last question. question. There's a lot of chatter online that Joe in this movie appears to be gay. Do you think that's a correct reading from the original text? I think it's a possible reading, right? As, as I said before, this book contains multitudes. And I know that there have been a lot of queer girls who have seen themselves reflected in Joe in the book. And I'm not going to tell them they can't read the book that way. Because I think we, we see ourselves, a lot of us see ourselves reflected in different aspects of these characters. And that has meant something to us. Um, what I think Greta Gerwig is doing in this film is um, she's showing us how Laurie too is also a bit more feminine, and you know they're sharing clothes. He and, and Joe, they're very close, and they're, that is the kind of brother sister kind of gender fluid type relationship that that Louisa May Alcott did present. And there's been some speculation about whether Alcott herself um, may have been lesbian or gay. Those are terms that really, those are identities that didn't really exist then. There were, of course, many Boston marriages of that period. Um, there were a lot of women who had uh, romantic relationships who lived together. And she knew many of these women. And later, late in her life, um, she did live with a woman doctor, and it's possible they had that sort of relationship. She said in one of her letters somewhere, Alcott said that she never loved any any uh, men in her life, but she'd fallen in love with many girls. What does that mean? You know, what did that mean to her? We don't know. I wouldn't want to impose our contemporary understandings of, of gender and, and sexuality onto Louisa or onto the text, but I think in many ways, um, Joe as a character in the book and her relationship with Laurie and Laurie as a character do uh, sort of foresee this kind of, this idea that gender is something that we learn, yes. gender is something we perform, it's not something we're born with. And these okay. characters are clearly a little uncomfortable with the gender norms that are being imposed on, on them, and they're pushing against them a little bit. So she's anticipating some of the discussions I think we have about gender fluidity today. I think that's right. And Alcott is very aware of gender as a performance in these other stories I mentioned. She yeah. certainly, why can't we identify with a Joe who in the book says, I'm the man of the family now that father is in the war. Or, she says, I always, yes, yeah, right. very disappointed she was never a born a boy. Right. Which in the 1994 film, they never include that line. That's one of the right. most important lines of the book. I think it is very, very telling that one of the most famous literary heroines of all time didn't even want to be a girl. right? Okay. And I think that speaks volumes to about the, the sort of discomfort that women have felt for generations about the sort of narrowness of the expectations put upon them. But it them. isn't necessarily that she doesn't want to be have a woman's body. It's, it's very tied to performing as a girl in society. I don't want to play that part in this script, right. I think. You know? mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. This was such a great conversation. Thank Thanks you. So Anne's going to be a uh, fire book. Uh, should be outside. And also listen to Open Source Thursday at 9 or Sunday, or you can do, listen to it anytime once you air. Open Source. Greta Gerwig talks for a half an hour with Chris Leiden. She talks about the movie and her decisions. And the person who talked to us about the cinematography, she goes into great detail about the colors of the oh, dresses okay. and the hair and all the decisions yeah, that went into it. So it's worth listening to. Thank you. No, I'm happy to sign copies outside. I'll be, back. I'll be outside in a minute. I just got to grab it. Thank you.